we have, at this point, learned three hand rules involving magnetic fields, vector currents, and so on. We're going to create a little table right now to summarize those three hand rules, when to use them, how to use them, and so on. The first one we have is the wire grasp rule. And of course, within the wire grasp rule, or any of the other hand rules for that matter, we can use our left hand or our right hand. Tom, when do we use our left hand? It doesn't matter what rule we're doing, when do we use our left hand? Good. And we use our right hand when it's a positive particle, right? Left hand negative particle, right hand positive particle. So the first one was the wire grasp rule, either left hand or right hand. The second one was the coil rule. Again, either left hand or right hand. 99% of the time within the coil rule, it's going to be the left hand. We haven't looked at any of them with the right hand for the coil rule yet, but I will give you a situation in just a few minutes when we do an example of when you might, okay, you might, it's not very, not very likely, but you might have to use your right hand for that one. Okay, the final one is the hand rule for deflection. And the hand rule for deflection, of course, we use our left hand, right hand all the time. It's about 50-50 on which one we have to use there. Okay, so when do we use them? When do we use the wire grasp rule, the coil rule, and the deflection rule? Um, we use the wire grasp rule when we have simply a moving charge or an electric current. Okay, does that make sense? Don't look at, don't look at uh, anything bigger than that. Okay, picture in your mind right now an electron or an alpha particle moving. Done. Or picture in your mind a wire with electrons flowing through that wire. Done. There's no external magnets. We're not involving the Earth's magnetic field. We're not involving an electromagnet or a coil of wire. We're not involving any of that. All we have is a moving charge or an electric current. And what do we want to do? We want to find the magnetic field caused by that. Not the external, not the one that was already there, the magnetic field caused by that. So we're going to say the moving charge or an electric current, magnetic field caused by the above, caused by the moving charge or the electric current. Whereas in the coil rule, the coil rule is found or is used whenever we have a coil of wire, or sometimes they call it a solenoid, with a current. You want to find the polarity of that coil, which end is north, which end is south. It's kind of the same thing as rule number one, right? Because in the end, you have a wire, you have moving charges going through it, you want to find the magnetic field, but we're just applying it to a very specific situation. That wire is wrapped up in a coil. That magnetic field produces a north pole and a south pole. We want to find the north pole and the south pole. We want to find the polarity of the coil. The third rule, the deflection rule, we have a moving charge. And we have an external magnetic field. For the first time, we have an external magnetic field. Two magnets, one magnet, the Earth, an electromagnet, anything that's causing a magnetic field that is not the moving charge. We have a moving charge and an external magnetic field. What you want to do there, typically, is find the magnetic force. So for the first time, we're dealing with an external magnetic field. For the first time, we're dealing with a magnetic force. So when you look at this table, it doesn't seem like it should be that difficult to figure out which rule to use. Sometimes, however, we see these things within applications, okay, within um, examples, contexts, not just, you know, here's a charge, it's moving this way, here's a field, 
it's this way, what's the direction of the force? Sometimes it's within a context, and then it becomes a little bit trickier. But we'll do an example or two of those contexts here in just a few minutes to see if you can keep those straight. I would argue that this is the most important part of the hand rules, when to do them. You can do them all you want. You know how to do the first rule, the second rule, the third rule. That's great. But if you don't know when to do the first rule, the second rule, the third rule, then it doesn't really matter if you know how to do it. But if you have a math problem and it involves multiplication, and you're good at multiplication, but you don't know when to use it, you look at this math problem and you're not sure whether to do multiplication or division, then it doesn't really matter that you know how to do multiplication. Okay, so we have to know, first of all and foremost, when to use these different hand rules. Well, then how do we use it? We have two or three variables in each of these cases. There is the thumb. There's the fingers, and sometimes there's the palm. So in the first one, we have the thumb, the fingers. In the second one, we have the thumb, the fingers. And in the third one, we have the thumb, the fingers, and the palm. The thumb in the first one points which way? we got three, two variables here, right? we got a magnetic field that's caused by the moving charge. We've got an electric current, moving charge. Which one does the thumb point in? Simon? Good. Points in the direction of the moving charge. Or if it's an electric current within the wire, which way is the current flowing within the wire? That's which way my thumb goes. Now, remember, in this one, i got to bend my fingers a little bit, right? Still looking at my fingertips, okay, my fingernails. Which way do my fingernails point, or my fingertips point? Patty, which way do my fingertips point in the wire grasp rule? Good. Not some external magnetic field, remember. If you've got another magnet nearby, it's probably not going to be the first rule. Okay, we're only looking at the magnetic field that's caused by that moving charge. So we're going to say that the, the fingers here are in the direction of the magnetic field caused by the moving charge. Doesn't seem very hard. The second rule, the coil rule, again, kind of just kind of like the wire grasp rule in the sense that we got a moving charge. We've got a magnetic field that's produced by that. We're trying to find the magnetic field, but we're applying it to a specific situation this time where we want to find the polarity of a coil that's produced when that wire is wrapped around something. The thumb this time is going to be opposite to what it was in the first case. Instead of being in the direction of the moving charge, the thumb is going to point in the direction of the magnetic field caused by the moving charge. or, in this case, caused by the moving charge within the coil. The fingers this time bent up a little bit, right? Looking at your fingertips, bent a little bit, just like in the first case, but the fingers this time are going to point in the direction of the moving charge. So if there's an electric current going up in the front, then put your fingers up in the front. If there's an electric current that's going up in the back, then put your fingers on that coil of wire, up in the back. See which way your thumb points. Okay, that will be the direction of the magnetic field inside the coil. And finally, the third rule, the deflection rule, the one that we learned yesterday. Thumb, fingers, palm. Bo, do you remember which way my thumb points in this one? Good. Direction of the moving charge. So we're back to the first rule here, kind of, right? A thumb points in the direction of the moving charge. Do you remember which way my fingers point, Daniel? Good. The direction of the external magnetic field, right? There is a magnetic field that's caused by the moving charge. 
but that's not the one that we're looking at right now. There is an interaction between that field and the external field, and that's what causes the force. But we don't have to look specifically at that magnetic field that's caused by the moving charge. Okay, we have to look specifically at the magnetic field that was already there, the external magnetic field. And finally, P, the palm, is going to point which way, Caitlin? Which way does the palm point in the third rule? Thumb, fingers? Good. The direction of the magnetic force. And it's always going to be perpendicular to uh, the field and perpendicular to the way the particle is moving. Remember, this rule only applies if the charged particle is moving perpendicular to the field. The only other situation we'll have when it's not moving perpendicular to the field, they're parallel. And what's the force then? Zero. So we don't have to worry about doing a hand rule and finding a direction of a force if there is no force, right? So we only have to worry about them, really, worry about them being perpendicular to each other. Because if they're parallel, they're zero. And if they're not parallel or per perpendicular, we don't see it in physics 30. You might later on. Okay, you might down the road if you take physics in the university. Well, you will. If you take physics in the university, you'll see them other than 90 degrees or zero. Okay, but um, not in physics 30. All right. I'm going to give you a couple situations, and I'm not going to tell you which hand rule applies or how to do it. Okay, we'll see if you can figure that out, okay? Here's the first case. See what I'm trying to do with this one? I get a loop of wire here, a coil of wire here. I don't have a core inside it. I don't have a piece of steel inside it. Okay, but you can see that my coil is kind of going, you know, the way it's going, right? Up like this and like this. You guys see that? Not a very good artist, but I'm trying to illustrate that. Uh, this is the positive end of the battery. This is the negative end of the battery. Um, we want to find um, which end is the north. Hey, you know what? Better question. Better question. I want to find the direction of the magnetic field at that point. Not the value of it, but I want to find the direction of the magnetic field at that point. Let's put it right in the middle, actually. Which hand rule am I going to use? Which hand rule am I going to use? Am I going to use the wire grasp rule? Am I going to use the coil rule? Or am I going to use the hand rule for deflection? Both? Good. I'm going to use the coil rule. we got a coil, so Odds are it's going to be the coil rule. Now, normally in the coil rule, we're trying to find the polarity, right? Well, we kind of are still trying to find the polarity here. It's the polarity that we're going to use to find the direction of the magnetic field right there. So don't lose any sleep over that. Okay, the fact that we're asked something slightly different here is okay, because in the end, it's clearly related to the polarity of this coil. So let's find that. Uh, we got an electric current that's going clockwise, sorry, counterclockwise here. That means it's going up in the back, down in the front. Up in the back, down in the front. Up in the back, down in the front. And it's going around, all the way around to the battery here, counterclockwise. Do we have to have a coil surrounding a piece of steel here? Does there have to be a ferromagnetic material inside? No, there usually is, right? Because that strengthens the effect. It makes it a stronger magnetic field. But there doesn't have to be one there. Okay, we can still find the direction of the magnetic field and the polarity just as easily without a core there is with a core there. It's just not as strong of a, of a field, that's all. So we've got our, our current going down in the front. Our current is represented by thumb or fingers? Fingers. So we're going to stick our fingers on this coil in the front pointing down, just like this. Okay? Remember, you're looking at the front, I'm looking at the back. Okay, my fingers are in the front pointing down. Bend my fist a little bit, bend my, bend my uh, fingers a little bit. My thumb is pointing which way? Towards the wrong hand. Yeah. Thumb's pointing towards the, towards the left. So the magnetic field inside this coil will be to the left. That will make this a north end and this a south end. We still haven't answered the question, though. The question is, what's the direction of the polarity above this coil? Sorry, what's the direction of the field above this coil? How do we figure that out? Why don't we just extend this? 
pretend it's a bar magnet. The magnetic field right above this coil would be to the right. Yep. I don't know that it's the north and south. Okay. Um, let's go back to rolling up that piece of paper again. Okay, my coil of wire. We can see here just by looking at the uh, battery that the current is going counterclockwise here, which means it's going up in the back and then down in the front. The dotted lines represent the back, the back of this coil. So it's going up in the back, down in the front, up in the back, down in the front, and so on. Okay, so take that piece of paper, roll it up again. Okay, you're looking at the front of this piece of paper. My fingers have to point in the direction of the current, which is down in the front. Okay, bend your fingers a little bit. Thumb is pointing which way? To the left. So the magnetic field inside that coil is pointing to the left, okay, the way that I have it drawn right there. Yes, yes. It always points uh, inside the coil from south to north. And then outside the coil, it goes around from north to south, the way that we typically define magnetic field. Does that make sense? So once we have the north and south here, it makes it not too bad to find the direction of the magnetic field right here, because we just extend that, we just extend that around. Let's try another one. This time we've got um, the Earth with this giant bar magnet, of course, that we all know exists within, within the Earth. Not really, right? It's like a giant magnet inside the Earth, but it's not really a magnet inside the Earth. What's the polarity of that magnet? This has nothing to do with the hand rule, right? We, just, we know the polarity of that imaginary magnet inside the Earth, right? This is, this is the North Pole or the South Pole? South Pole, magnetic South Pole. This is magnetic North Pole, right? Uh, that's not an N, that's an M. North, there you go. We got a magnetic field that goes like this. And of course, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go up like this. Um, let's say this is the equator right here. Let's say you've got some charged particle coming in from space. Okay, maybe it's coming from some kind of solar activity, some kind of solar flare. Let's say it's a positively charged particle. And let's say that positively charged particle is coming in like this. And that positively charged particle will be deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. By the way, that's when these charged particles come in at the poles, that's what causes the borealis, right? Like, so it causes the northern lights and the southern lights. These, these charged particles getting deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. There's a little bit more to it than just that, okay? but that's, in essence, what it comes down to is these charged particles coming in at the poles um, causing certain um, um, atomic transitions, which is causing, which causes the light to, to be produced. Um, well, generally, it wouldn't. If a solar flare probably wouldn't take out electricity from a city, it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. But it could. I mean, that would be possible. The issue that we face more often than that is things like communication satellites and television satellites and whatever. I mean, remember the charged particles. Okay? Um, and electricity can do funny things to other e electronic things. So if all of a sudden you have, you know, I, I think I told you guys about the story about um, when I was in university and uh, I had bought my computer and it wasn't grounded. And so what happened, to, I told you guys about that one, right? The charge built up on the hard drive it became so big that it eventually discharged and it wrecked it. Right? It destroyed the hard drive on the computer. Electricity can do funny things to electronic things. It can cause surges. It can cause discharge. It can cause, you know, a lot of electronics. Honestly, digital electronics is generally based on voltages of 5 volts. So if all of a sudden you have, you know, an electric shock, well, that's minimum 15,000 volts. If you were to, I shouldn't say that. If, you, if it's strong enough to feel it's about 15,000 volts or more. So if all of a sudden you're, you're, you're discharging from a satellite or you're putting all this extra charge into a satellite all of a sudden and you're dealing with voltages of thousands of volts but it's sensitive to less than 10, then it can cause damage to those things, right? Generally though, as I say, it wouldn't take out the power of a city. I wouldn't say that it's impossible, but generally that wouldn't happen. So we've got a positive charged particle coming in from the sun or coming from somewhere else. We want to know which way it's deflected. Okay, we want to know which way it's going to go as a result of this. Okay, here's the first question. What hand rule is that? 
Is that the wire grasp rule? Is that the coil rule? Or is that the hand rule for deflection? Boy, this doesn't seem as easy as the questions that we've done over the last week, right? It's not just, here's the particle, here's the field, blah, blah, blah. There's a context here, and this is what we've got to be able to do. Which hand rule is it, guys? Think about it fundamentally. Do we have simply a moving charge that we're trying to find the field direction of? Do we have a coil of wire that we're trying to find the polarity of? Or do we have a charge moving through in a magnetic field that we're trying to find the direction of the force on? Which one is it? Oh, it's deflection, right? We're trying to find the force on this particle that's moving through an external magnetic field. All right, let's do it now. It's a right-hand rule for deflection because it's a positive particle. We're going to stick a thumb in the direction of the particle, which is uh, kind of down and to the right, right, like this. My fingers are going to be stretched out this time, not, not bent. It's going to be thumb, fingers in the direction of the field, which at that point where they go enter the magnetic field, the field is upwards. So it's going to be thumb, fingers, upwards like this. Palm points which way? Out of the page. So the direction of the force on this particle would be like this, out of the page. Does that make sense? That's one of the issues, by the way, too, with... I'm not sure if we talked about this the other day or not in this class, but um, we have a certain polarity with the Earth, right? we got a North Pole, we have a South Pole, and it's opposite to what most people think that it really is, right? Technically, it's opposite. Um, but the Earth's magnetic field actually reverses. There's a history of the Earth's magnetic field reversing. The geological records show that every 250,000 years-ish, the Earth's magnetic field actually switches. So the North Pole becomes the South Pole, and the South Pole becomes the North Pole. Now, did I, were we talking about this the other day with you guys? No? So it happens on average about every 250,000 years. We're about 700, it's been about 750,000 years since it's happened last. So we're about 500,000 years overdue for the Earth's magnetic field reversing. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen anytime soon, but it means it could happen sometime soon. We've actually noticed a significant decline in the strength of the Earth's magnetic field over the last 100 years, like by, in the double-digit percentages, in the strength of the Earth's magnetic field within the last 100 years. So there's a lot of scientists out there that actually think that it's happening. That, that right now we're actually in that phase of transition where the Earth's magnetic field will weaken and then reverse. So it's possible within the next 200 years, literally, that the poles could be reversed, which is a pretty big deal, right? If we're around or our kids or our grandchildren are around during such a monumental geological event of the Earth's magnetic field reversing. If it does do that, what's probably going to happen is it's going to decrease in strength, decrease in strength, and decrease in strength to the point where it flips over and then increases in strength in the opposite direction. If it decreases in strength, that's a problem. Because although the atmosphere provides some protection from charged particles, the Earth's magnetic field also provides a lot of protection from, from charged particles coming from the sun. And these charged particles coming from the sun can, can hurt us. They can, they can hurt us. They're not good for us. They can cause all kinds of things like cancers and all kinds of illnesses with us and all kinds of issues with satellites and, and other things, right? So what happens here? If the Earth's magnetic field isn't there or it's weaker, this charged particle that's coming in like this from the sun doesn't get deflected out like this. What happens to it? It just goes straight in and hits the Earth or whoever it is that's standing at that position on the Earth. So that can be a problem. Now, again, it's not necessarily catastrophic because there's other layers of protection from these particles as well, including the, the atmosphere. But there's definitely been a higher incidence of charged particles reaching the Earth than there is right now. Yep. Yep. Um, no, you know what? That's a good. That's a good question. I would have to say no to that. Um, the the question was, if you didn't hear, guys, um, the the decrease in the strength of the Earth's magnetic field could that could that result in some some at least be partially responsible for global warming? Um, global warming occurs when 
when ultraviolet light from the sun comes in, gets absorbed by the Earth, gets re-emitted as infrared, which is, which is heat, right? And then gets stopped from escaping by the Earth's atmosphere. So it doesn't really have anything to do with the charged particles coming in from the sun. It's the ultraviolet, which is a form of electromagnetic radiation that comes in from the sun. And that's going to come in from the sun all the time, whether we have global warming or not. The issue is um, when it gets re-emitted as infrared, the infrared gets bounces back when it hits things like carbon dioxide. By the way, what's the biggest? What's the uh, the biggest greenhouse gas that exists? Carbon dioxide is not the biggest one, not even close. What's the one that causes the most global warming? No, CFCs cause the cause the hole in the ozone layer, which is actually getting better. After a conference in Montreal, actually a conference in Montreal in the I believe it was in the 80s, there was a, a thing signed, uh, like an agreement signed, and and to eliminate CFCs, and that's actually getting better as a result of that. Nope, methane's pretty big. Yeah, we can't do much about methane because when cows fart, they they make methane. The biggest one is water, water vapor. But it's kind of this vicious cycle, right? Because you put a bunch of carbon dioxide up there, what happens? Well, the earth warms up a little bit. What happens? Well, more water evaporates. What happens? Well, more water evaporating makes the problem even bigger. So it's this massive positive feedback system, right? Where we cause something a little bit, and then nature kind of kicks into high gear and makes it even worse, right? Anyways, that's... Not really a physics thing. Um, but to answer your question, no, the positive particles coming in wouldn't change, wouldn't, wouldn't affect global warming. Okay, at least to the best of my knowledge, it wouldn't have any effect on it at all. Okay, does that question make sense? Okay, one more. Let's go, you know what, let's go back to this one, actually. Let's throw a wire in here. It, I, it's crazy, because that's a big wire. Like, that's a big wire if it's going past the Earth like this. But let's say that wire has a current going through it like this. We want to find the direction of the magnetic field caused by that wire. Okay, listen carefully to what I just said. We want to find the direction of the magnetic field caused by that wire. Which rule do we use? Fire grasp rule? Coil rule? Deflection rule? We'll probably eliminate one of them right away, right? Coil rule. So is it one or three, the wire grasp rule or the rule for deflection? Yep. Would it be number three? Who agrees? We've got a 50 50 chance, so I want you to commit to something. Who agrees with number three? Who says number one? Oh, Tom, you're outvoted. It would be number one, actually. Now, number three is not out of the question here, right? We do have moving charges, we do have an external magnetic field, right? So you think number three, right? But we're not trying to find a force on this particle or on this wire. We're trying to find a field that's caused by the moving charges. That makes it rule number one. Does that make sense, Tom? So we're gonna look at this and say, look, it's negative particles, thumb in the direction of the particle, fingers in the direction of the field. Immediately to the right of that, it's pointing into the page. To the left of it, it's pointing out of the page, in front of it, it's pointing to the to the uh, right, and behind it, it's pointing to the left. Make sense? That's a tricky one, right? As soon as you see that external field, you think in rule number three. But we're still not trying to find a force there. And we'll